Thank you, Jim Shui, for your kind introduction. My colleagues at the Sai University, parents, students, friends, and well wishes of Sai University, I welcome you all to this open house event of Sai University. It's a great pleasure for me to be here talking to a new cohort of students. And I often hear that Sai University is a new university, and I'm going to differ slightly to say this is the third year of Sai University. You let me make a reminder, we're still new, we're a young university. Year before, we started Sai University with what's called Daksha Fellowship, the one year program in postgraduate law. And those students are now practicing in the top law firms of the country in technology law. And last year, we started our undergraduate education, which is second year of the university. And those students are now moving into the second year. And now I believe I'm addressing the third cohort of Sai University, which will be starting in September this year. So welcome to Sai University, a young budding university. And it's been a great pleasure and privilege to talk to all of you. And later in the day, at the end of the formal program, that we are going to be taking questions and answers. So just to begin, I want to say that Sai University has been started with a vision to create an international university in India. Some of you might have heard these phrases from me in our one-on-one -on -one interaction, but many of the faces I see in the audience are new to me, and therefore me, the cost of repetition, I'm going to say some of this again. That is kind of shocking to see in the 75th year of independence, there is not even one university from India, the top 100 universities according to Times International Ranking or Skewers International Ranking. Our most eminent institutions come at 125 to 150. Most private universities, the leading private universities are in 700 ranking. And most of our education institutions are in the 3000 ranking globally. These are facts you can verify on the net. Second, we have 1,400 universities approximately, give or take a few, in this country. 1,400. <coughs> How come not even one has hit the top 100 of the world? These are questions you must ask. The question must be answered. There are no easy answers, but the question must be asked. Only when we question ourselves, we can improve our performance. The second, there are nearly 40,000 colleges in this country, 40,000. Every year about 3 crore students are graduating from school to enter into higher education, 3 crores. We are a young nation. We are a country with the highest number of adolescent young people in the world. So are we providing the right learning environment for them. To my mind it doesn't appear so. If we had been providing a great educational environment for our young students of this country, then we certainly would have grabbed a few of the top slots. Not only that, the shocking news is 3.5 lakh Indian students are going each year for undergraduate education abroad. 3.5 lakh. These are figures published by the government of India in answers to parliament questions. You can look it up. The government has also said at any time there are 14 lakh Indian students studying abroad. 14 lakh Indian students abroad. Assuming 3.5 lakh students each year for a four year program at least. Just imagine what it costs the parent. Many of them were taking bank loans and saving the children to get better quality of education. It costing each parent approximately 1.2 crores for a four-year education. 
roughly 25 lakhs for tuition and about 5 lakhs for hostel or boarding expenses. So what are we keeping back? The mammoth amount of 14 to 15 lakh crore rupees flowing out of this country to other countries to provide a bright young minds a better quality of education. And not only that, especially the undergraduate students who are 17 or 18, we are completely disturbing their social fabric, moving them and they are not fully grown adult, adults, moving them to an alien society where they have to adjust to people from around the world, new food habits, they have to take care of themselves, cook, eat, clean, laundry, the whole stuff. And Apart from all of that, we do expect them to be away from family and friends, emotionally disconnected. And above all, we expect them to perform well and top their classes in a globally competitive environment at the age of 17 and 18. Why has this happened? Why couldn't we provide those students at least an opportunity for good undergrad education in this country? And why can't we move them if they cannot provide the specialization that they want? They want to study nuclear medicine. There is no opportunity in India. If they go abroad for a postgraduate or a PhD program, I do understand. I'm not saying international education, but it's welcome. But it should be based on a need. It should not be a necessity because you're thrown out of this country. You do not have enough opportunities in this country. So born out of this need, a strong desire, to do something about a major weakness in our higher education system is the vision for Sahar University. And we dedicate ourselves to making Sahar University amongst the top 100 universities of the world in the shortest span of time. Thank you. So vision or success like this does not come by just visual thinking. It requires careful planning, clear execution, and of course problem solving. Because no institution will however hold a new interest, will have challenges. But first of all, we need to have proof of concept. Is this doable or are we chasing a dream? Coming from my own industry, tech sector, mid-80s, we had asked questions in the US, have you come to sell software or buy software, we are confused. We only heard of saints and cows in streets of India, we never heard of software from India, what are you trying to do here? Insulting. But in 35 years from a zero, we have come to a base of $150 billion of exports in software industry and $35 billion of domestic industry. I'm still as a chairman emeritus in ASCOM, so I have to the latest data which is coming in. And our Honorable Prime Minister has given us a target of $300 billion to be achieved in the next four years. The reason is very simple. The entire software industry is earning more foreign exchange than oil consumed by the whole country. Our oil and gas imports is $135 billion. And this industry alone funds the entire oil imports, $150 billion in exports, and is growing. So you can see that today if you start a company in the US, the first question is asked, if you're coffee in company in San Jose, and if you go to a private equity venture in the US, the first question that's asked is what is your India connection? If you do not have an India connection, set up a partnership with an Indian company or whatever you want to do, then only we will get funding. So the industry has completely changed 180 degrees from where is India, where is software to without Indian software it is not possible to start an enterprise anywhere else in the world. That I think is proof of concept that India can do it. The second is our own healthcare sector. 30 years ago people had to go to US for a bypass surgery. Now you can see Westerners coming here 
on medical tourism to get the same care as they would get in any advanced country of the world. Better nursing care, same equipment, same doctors, better nursing care at one for the cost of treatment. So we have proved again that in the case of healthcare, we have become a global leader. We are attracting medical tourists. Insurance companies in the US have started paying their patients and an accompanying person. The entire cost of airfare, hotel stay and treatment and come back to US because it's still less expensive for them than to get treated in the US. Even in the UK, unfortunate member of a NHS, it will take you at least one week, ten days to get an appointment with the doctor. Here if you go to a leading corporate hospital by 7 in the morning, in the afternoon you come back with every part of your body examined from head to foot to the medical reports, the opinion, a prescription and a complete diagnosis. That's how far we have developed in 30 years in the healthcare sector. And in the most recent past during the pandemic, we have seen that India is one of the few countries in the world which produces two vaccines within a shorter span of time. So in biotech space, again we proved that we can be a global leader. And of course in execution, our own government institutions in defense space and nuclear engineering have shown that in terms of competence, in space sciences, in nuclear sciences, defense engineering, we are comparable to the world in producing a lot of our equipment which is required for modern warfare. So if we've done all of this in all these sectors, the proof of concept is there that we just have to repeat that magic in higher education. So with that simple confirmation of our proof of concept, we started SAI University and the early part of the 18 months, we took to design, conceptualize, prepare a detailed project report to execute this vision. And this period, we designed Sai University to be standing on five strong pillars. That's a fundamental to our strategy. The first pillar is governance. No institution can be great unless it has a board of governors who are experts in that field and they are able to guide the institution to its success and glory. So I am proud to say that our board of governors consists of four Padma Vibhushan awardees and a Padma Sri. I am going to illustrate a few of them. That no other Indian institution of any kind has five Padma awards in its board. No one. And they are not here just because they are Padma Awardees. <laughs> Each one of them, our 18 Padma Board, is here for a specific reason. Mr. Narayan Murthy is here, not as an entrepreneur, but he is here because he is on the board of four international universities. Not many people know that the board of Harvard, Caltech, Ecole in France, and Tokyo University. We wanted to get the international learning experience. Mr. Ashant Desai is on board of IIM Ahmedabad and IIT Mumbai. Perhaps the two top institutions this country has ever produced. So we are getting the experience of the Ivy Leagues of India governing. And we have the most eminent former Chief Justice of India, most accomplished legal luminary, former Chief Justice Sivinta Chalaya. A man, a varied scholar, is on our board giving us guidance on legal education. And he is not only a Chief Justice of India, he is a great scholar that I, one day in Bangalore I spent with him to see his routine. After meeting him in the morning about science, his plans, and directions and taking his advice and starting the law school, I found that afternoon he was speaking in a forum on environment. 
and in the evening he is talking about a forum on the frontiers of science and law. So he in fact asks a classic question that the way this globe is evolving, technology is evolving, his passion is that all branches of learning will converge in law. He asks himself, can you just elaborate his two prophetic statements? His point is very simple. He said, you take a drone or a robot, someone programs it to kill somebody. Who are going to prosecute? The designer of the drone or the robot? Or the hardware manufacturer, the software developer? Or the system integrator? Or someone who programmed it to aim a target or someone put an arm in the hands of the device, there is no answers in law. With this simple question converges several frontiers of technology and today's law anywhere in the world does not have an answer unless you draw law by inference of an existing law to extend it to this application. So just to say that such a malicious person is guiding us along with the uh, senior advocate uh, and international mediator Mr. Sri Ram Panchu is also on our board. Both of them are guiding our law school. Then of course the most uh, eminent professor Kastur Rangan, space scientist chairman of ISRO and most recently the chairman of the new education policy of India 2020. He is advising us on science as well as in the new education policy. Dr. Professor Anil Kakotkar, former chairman of Atomic Energy Commission, is guiding us on nuclear sciences and other engineering and technology disciplines. I can go on and on. Ms. Bhakti Ramola, former country head of PricewaterhouseCoopers, brings in management experience along with Ms. Savita Marajan, former ISD, Hyderabad. Uh, Sunita Reddy, managing director of Apollo, brings in healthcare experience. So, just the list is long without sounding to be boring. I said that fundamentals of a university are on five pillars, and the first pillar is what the names have suggested are the board of governors of the university. We provide the strategy and vision for the university to implement the concept of building a great international university in India. And the second pillar is our faculty led by our learned vice chancellor Professor Jamsha Barucha <laughs> and all of the faculty members on the dais and some of them who was not on the dais to say that we thankful to Professor Barucha for What do we say? Collecting. Because it is not a faculty team which is put together at random. He has been crafting by carefully selected specialists in each branch for their accomplishments in India and abroad. Apart from himself, I don't know if we have been introduced. Professor Barucha himself is an academician of 40 years uh, standing. With background in Dartmouth College and Tufts College, there's Tufts University, uh, Harvard University where he got a PhD in cognitive neuroscience and of course he's been a visiting faculty in Stanford. the list is again long. Such an eminent person, we also have the Dean of Law School, Professor Dina Patel who couldn't be here, unfortunately she's unwell. She'll be back in a couple of weeks. Who is the founding batch of NLS in Bangalore and then went on to do a master's and PhD at Warwick University in the UK, continued to become a professor of law and joined us recently at the Dean of Law School. And you can see the assembly of uh, the great uh, learned faculty here. Each one is a who's who in their own field. And we also have a strong list of visiting faculty from 
India and abroad, who will be providing our students the length and the breadth of knowledge. The third pillar is the curriculum. I won't take any credit for it, except to say that we wanted to create the international concept of multidisciplinary interdisciplinary education as a one blind statement. And our most accomplished Vice Chancellor, Professor Bircha, has put together a program which is truly international curriculum, multidisciplinary interdisciplinary learning across schools. As you know, we have three schools today, School of Arts and Sciences, School of Computing and Data Sciences, and School of Law. And I only want to say that today you may have interdisciplinary education in three schools, but very soon, in the next three, four years, we are planning other schools and schools of management in the BBA, BCom, MBA. We are planning a school of uh, technology with nuclear, space, defense, and other engineering disciplines. And after building a hospital, we are going a school of health sciences. So as we progress in our journey, the students of the future batches will have the option to choose from not only three schools, but have the option to choose from seven schools in traditional education. It is simple to say, that a curriculum, Professor Baruch is passionate about, is to break the silos of Indian education system from its foundation. Our current system is, we take economics, you get psychology, statistics as mandatory subjects. You take physics, you take chemistry and mathematics. The reason is, a student may be interested in physics, but may not necessarily be interested in chemistry. So, Sal University curriculum, Professor Burucha is designed in such a way that a student could actually study a physics major with a computer science minor and a law minor, or any such combination. As we introduce more and more schools and more and more subjects, the combinations will become, as you know, combinatorial equation, options will multiply for the student. The basic idea is simple. We actually do not know what next 10 years is going to look like. The world is changing so rapidly, technology is changing so rapidly, the students need to adapt themselves to the evolving trends rather than actual discoveries of the past. They need to know what is going to emerge rather than what has been already demonstrated. So the concept of interdisciplinary multidisciplinary education is to provide the student at undergraduate level especially the ability to be knowledgeable in a wide array of subjects so that they can specialize in their masters and a PhD. And in fact, I would go to the extent of saying India has got it right in healthcare sector. If you take our healthcare sector, excuse me, can I have some water, please? In our healthcare sector, we have an undergrad degree which is called MBBS, which is Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Surgery, which gives you a broad foundation in medicine or healthcare. As you go along, you specialize, masters, next choice is you. Thank you. I'm sorry, it's very warm with the blood lights on my face. As I said, in masters, the student really has a choice whether they want to pursue medicine or, or surgery. There are only two paths. You take being physician, then you become an MD. If you want to become a surgeon, you select an MS. Then when you go higher up, you specialize further. You become DM cardiology. 
this is a super specialization as we know we call them super consultants so the brace is broad and you specialize as you go up the chain is like a pyramid so side university curriculum design by professor Burcha and the, our colleagues of the faculty here gives the students the same broad base in undergraduate education with the freedom to choose subjects as they go along the value chain toward postgraduate and doctoral programs alongside they will be able to find their passion and pursue it. I'm just going to quickly say two anecdotes to make some of our young students here to think. That most students when they come out of school, they do not know what subject they want to pursue. They go with the choice of the parents or friends and family or their BF of and within a year or so, they find that the BFF and they don't get along in the room or the hostel. And then the trouble begins in the second year of undergraduate education. You have a problem with your BFF, you have a problem with your room, and you also have a problem with your subject. And it's too late to do anything about any of them. You get stuck with four years, right? The second thing we notice in student selection of subject is very clearly we thought a strong career perspective. Some people are able to decide on their career perspective when they are in high school, but many of them are not able to decide. So we have a battery of counselors, principals, educators, and telling the students more than what they want to hear. In my thinking, it confuses them more than ever. When you get multiple inputs into you, the system cannot process it, then you're getting more and more confused about what your choices are. You possibly get it right to say, yeah, I want to pursue medicine, I want to apply in arts, I want to apply in engineering, I want to get law. Broad counters of your career you decide, but you're not able to identify a specialization that you want to get into. You discover yourself along the way. That our system of education allows you to do that during your entire journey inside university. It is not one-stop shop. It allows you to experiment and take your courses of your choice. So that is the beauty of our interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary curriculum designed by Professor Burcha and my colleagues at the Sahar University. Two students are worth mentioning. Last year, first cohort, like this, we are being interviewed by students and parents. One student came to us, Professor Burrich and I were sitting and meeting with the parents and students and this girl asked, sir, can you give me biotech, computer science and law combination? He told her, the yes, master, you can always choose it in second year. He says, no, no other university is offering that in India. If you confirm to me that you're offering, I'll join now. We confirmed to her and she joined. And then I was curious to ask her, what, why did you choose this combination? The answer of the student was very clear. She said, I want to do research in bioinformatics and become a specialist in bioinformatics in my career. So I want to have an understanding of biotech and my UG. And I'm going to do postgraduate program and research program where I have to do a lot of data collection and research as part of biotech research and bioinformatics. So I want to have computer science knowledge. And I aim to make some discoveries in biotech field and patent them and monetize them. And therefore, I want to understand law. Very crystal clear thinking for a 17, 18 year old girl. We are amazed. Another story worth mentioning is a uh, boy who wanted a combination of music, computer science and law and said, sir, no other university is offering, can you offer? Of course, Professor Mirichik confirmed that we do have this combination for you. And then again, the same question followed. The answer of the student was very simple. The student said, sir, I don't want to pursue higher education. After UG, I want to start my own company in digital music. And therefore, I want to understand music, I want to understand computer science. And to start a company, I want to understand law. 
Of course, the student is studying here. The reason I'm saying is this kind of combination that we are offering is allowed for the students to select. It is not a combo which is offered by the university, take it or leave it. It's not one size fits all. It's a customized by the student. And when the student is not clear at the time of joining, they find out what they want during the first year journey by sampling several subjects and therefore they can make an informed decision about what they want to pursue and sometimes it may not be exactly what their parents or friends and family want to do. I must also say thanks to the process here another anecdote last year the first batch students first student we joined in computer science BTEC at the end of first year has already selected arts and science as a major for second year completely switched the mind from an engineering degree to arts and science degree because this girl has gone through both computer science and an arts and science program the same to international faculty from international development to you know blockchain technology all of this and after listening to all of that she said no sir can I change my major of course you can change your major because second year is when they actually choose the major and two minors another interesting anecdote is Professor Saraswati R uh, even in computer science uh, faculty at the end of year one gave a competition to the students on robotics there were, I think, eight teams or so. It's a group project. And they were given our micro robots to program it using Python to do a simple snakes and ladder game with the manual intervention. And to all our surprise, the winner was an arts and science student, not a computer science student. So what I'm trying to say is that the latent talent of the student actually blossoms in Sai University. You may be thinking they have talent in some field. The student may be thinking they have talent in some other field. But when they study at Sai University, they discover themselves. That's what Professor Barucha coins it as find your passion. When they go through the first year of program itself, they start finding the passion and then they work toward becoming specialists and leaders in their respective fields. So that is our third pillar of the curriculum. The fourth is the infrastructure, where I would say we have 103 acres of land. I think many of you have seen that land and building. We have, uh, I think, a uh, presentation or some kind at the end of the talk today, where we have the first building which is ready to be occupied right now for about 340 students. I would say this is perhaps uh, the weakest uh, pillar right now. And we are aware of it and we are strengthening it in double speed. So we are putting up a second building for another 360 students, which will be ready on September 9th. Only thing which we will not have is a campus housing for students which is under construction, but is not going to be ready until December 23rd. And therefore, for the first four months, we are going to host our students into a hotel or a resort nearby Mamalapuram that we are at our cost. We love to be The key reason is that we want to make sure that the campus is completely ready before we receive the students. And therefore, for the first four months, the students will be staying, but it will be completely under our care. Like we did for the first, first cohort last year. We hosted four months of last year the students in a hotel right opposite to the university called Gokulam Park. We took an entire floor on lease. We have hosted the students two to a room. We arranged for 24 by 7 security on the floor. The warden staying with the students in their rooms. We brought a student lounge with indoor entertainment, indoor games. We had a TV lounge. Only time they had to leave the floor was to have a meal in the hotel which is also supervised. All the time they're coming to the campus for study, which is on, although it is like less than 50 meters across the road. In order to avoid any risk to students, we provided a coach service morning to mind. 
so they can come whenever they want to go back whenever they want to do. Because when the students are with us, their safety, security and well-being is our concern, is not your concern. So in the same way, we are planning, we have seen a few properties, we are not able to make an announcement today, but you will all be informed soon by our mailers with pictures of what we are providing. Shared housing with the twin shared AC room where the students will be living within a 10-15 km radius of the university for the first four months. By end of December, early January, they will be in the campus. But of course, the campus facilities will be not lacking. The students will have the classroom, will have the labs, will have the faculty, officers, will have students, indoor entertainment facilities, they will have table tennis, billiards, board games, they will have a cafeteria, meal room, and they will have also uh, outdoor sports, football, cricket, badminton, uh, what else? We have, I think, uh, tennis, we have basketball, all of that will be ready by the time the students come on to the campus by first week of September. The only thing which will not be there, the security will be present 24 by 7. So only thing which will not be there will be residents for the first four months. So the students will be invited to campus in December, early January. These are subjective conditions that two factors on which we have no control. One is the pandemic and the second is the monsoon. Chennai monsoon is usually October. We are hoping to beat the deadline. But for some reason, if there is a heavy thunder shower or something happens, which happened a couple of weeks ago, there may be a slight delay, but we are hoping that it will not be the case. Looking at how hot it is outside, I think we will be lucky until September. So that's the fourth pillar, the infrastructure. But the infrastructure, I can assure you, in the next nine years, we are building 25 lakh square feet. I see eyebrows going up. 25 lakh square feet we are going to be building up in the next nine to ten years, max. And we have a very unique architecture. Some videos are available for those who have not seen it. The architects were selected based on a competition of international architects. 18 participated and after three rounds, our campus committee selected an architect Bangalore based. So it's a very unique architecture of the campus which each school having its own building interconnected with the radial building which is the student's amenity center for tea, coffee, beverage, for Wi-Fi hotspots, reading rooms, work spots, chill out zones, all of that. Apart from that, the campus will be a mini city with the faculty housing, convenience stores, restaurants, UG housing, PG housing, indoor games, swimming pools. We have everything that you can open a theater, conference halls, auditoriums, everything will be there in 9 to 10 years time frame roughly. So when it's fully fledged, the university campus of 103 acres, we designed to accommodate 20,000 students. So we are now today talking about 200, but soon I think it will be closer to that magic figure of 20,000. But it assumes that the basic paradigm of education will change. That with augmented reality and virtual reality expected to evolve in the next few years, the system of education itself will change. And there may not be a full-time need for the student or faculty to go to a campus. We do realize that. But we will roll up the infrastructure as the demand arises one year ahead of the demand. That is to say, for the next year batch, we will start building now. For the following year batch, we will build next year. So we will be building approximately about 10 academic blocks and about 25 housing blocks. The campus will be self-contained when it is fully developed. We will even have a shopping mall so the students who feel like going out, they don't even have to go to out to have a pizza or buy a t-shirt or whatever, it will all be available in the campus. So the students uh, not only are going to be acquiring knowledge, but they are going to be learning about how to live with each other and they have facilities for indoor sports, outdoor sports, their nutrition and their social needs taken care of all within the campus. And the last pillar of course are the dear students. 
without throwing the no university, without throwing the no education institution. So we are looking at the best and brightest of the minds to join, for not only academically strong, but for active learners. That's why we see our admission process does not give too much weightage and marks. We do not believe a student can be judged on one mark. Some institutions take great pride in saying our cutoff is 100%. If your cutoff is 100%, what do you need the teacher? In my mind, the question arises that maybe the student is so good that they can study themselves. You only need to have a system where you can test them and give a degree. The ability of the student to interact with each other, to learn from faculty, answer queries in their minds, and be satisfied with the knowledge acquisition from the faculty, from the readings, from the library, from other students, and the culture of the university campus. That is the most valuable learning experience. And therefore, the admissions process designed by Professor Brucha and the, our faculty team is a holistic process of evaluating the student on the overall ability of the student to study in the university, not on one mark. Because maybe on that day the student wasn't feeling too well, and you can punish the student for one missed exam. So we take into account all of this uh, marks of the schooling system as well as the application quality, the statement of purpose, the recommend testimonials from the schools, the um, uh, interview or the meeting with the faculty, all of these add to the weight of the student selection. And apart from all of that, the faculty also make an assessment of the ability of the student to study in a multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary education system. Therefore, dear friends, I'm I exceeded the time given to me by Professor Baricha, my apologies, sir. <laughs> so, the key points that I want to say is that for the Sai University has been founded on a very powerful vision managed by an eminent board of governors with accomplished faculty, with the innovative curriculum, world-class infrastructure under construction and the best of students. So we believe this experience of Sai University will not only help us to get to the top in the world ranking, but it will change the minds of other education institutions across this country to start following the example of Sai University and adapt themselves to this model. I can only say that the last few months I am already seeing ads by other universities saying we are multidisciplinary, we are interdisciplinary, all that. They are beginning to appear. So there is somewhere along the line we are hitting the right note. The people, as they said, copying is the best appreciation we can get. Therefore, we believe we are on a strong path. We believe we are in the right direction. And together, Come help us build Sai University to be the world's best university. Thank you.